Let me tell you why I'm here. For one thing, I'm here because Thomas Hartung said I must be here. And when Thomas tells me something like that, I'm here. <laughs> but I'm here because of who you are and what you can do. You are the voices of good food. You are the voice of good food. And we need that voice now more than ever before. You're also chefs and writers. You're chemists, you're artists, you're engineers, you're entrepreneurs, and you're prophets. You're prophets of this age. And this is an age of radical transparency. So speaking of influence, this community here today has tremendous influence in the world in which I live. And so I'm going to tell you two stories. One story where chefs and those of you who speak for good food made a big difference in my life, and another story where that influence was missing, and that story has taken much longer to come to fruition. I was trained as a vegetable breeder. Actually, I headed into science at an early age because I was interested in health, and I was interested in the environment. I launched off in a, in a very elite graduate program and saw the light and went into agriculture at a time when that was not fashionable. I'm a geneticist. I picked vegetables for many of the reasons that you all pick vegetables as your media. Vegetables gave me a chance to combine my science with art, to, to recognize the aesthetic and the complexities of taste and appearance in a food in a food of great importance in your cuisines, and in a food that is incredibly important in the developing world and underused and underinvested all over this earth. So, as a vegetable breeder, I went to my, a, a university and had the good fortune of, um, among other things, inheriting an incredible legacy from others who'd worked over decades before me. Now, one thing that man taught me as a vegetable breeder is it's good to eat what it is you're turning over to the likes of you. Most breeders in those days, and still today, didn't eat what they bred. Hmm, kind of shows, doesn't it? We ate the vegetables we bred, and they tasted better. We selected for taste, and as a consequence, by about 10 years in, I had something every plant breeder at least in the U.S., but it's a global award wanted. I had an all-America variety. I also had one little brown packet of 100 seeds. And it was at that moment that I realized I worked in partnership. I worked in partnership with the people that were going to take that little brown packet of seed and turn it into a variety with the story connected to that variety. It was a squash variety, a winter squash variety, a bush delicata, delicious. Um, weaving together the best flavors from a, an heirloom with modern characteristics such as disease resistance. And it was through that variety two important things happened. Number one, I realized as a public sector plant breeder, I needed the seed industry because that's who took that variety out to impact. And number two, this variety was especially suited for production in organic environments. And so I did something that was unfashionable or actually quite impossible at the time. And that was to begin to recognize the importance of breeding in and for organically managed agriculture. At the time, our university had no organically managed production fields, so guess what I had to do? I had to work with organic farmers. I thought we just wouldn't spray, be fine. Actually, what I learned from those years working on those farms was how incredibly important systems thinking is. It's important in every field of science. It's critically important in this century as we find our way forward. So, through those breeding efforts, yes, we had some new varieties. We're especially proud of one that came out last year called Peacework, after the farm and, and the farmer who, um, who brought us into this community. Chefs caught sight of the work we were doing. It was in upstate New York, near some big markets. Chefs are the ones that called for those varieties. Farmers grew them, 
They had characteristics that were desirable for farmers like disease resistance and compact plant habits. But they also tasted delicious and were beautiful. And that system set up a cycle that eventually allowed me to recognize that even though the commercial seed sector was not extremely well developed for organic agriculture, we could put together a partnership. A partnership we call the Organic Seed Partnership to ensure that not only these varieties were available, but that organically grown seed was available. We did it as a network, and it's been a very successful adventure in the United States. Chefs played a critically important part in creating the demand that made that healthy food system. Good food comes from healthy food systems. Well, the question then was, what would this look like at scale? And interestingly, a university in the heartland, not necessarily famous for its um, innovation in agriculture, um, at least in, in your community, but actually a place where um, a great deal of, of 20th century agriculture was invented, looked around and spotted our work and invited me to come and be dean of a large Midwestern College of Agriculture that was unusual behavior, and it allowed us to do some critically important experiments at scale, at scale. What if we took what I learned from organic agriculture, that is that here affects there and now affects later, and we applied those principles at scale in agriculture? By this time, we were understanding some things about agriculture that are critically important in this century. Agriculture globally is estimated to emit about one-third of the greenhouse gas emissions on the planet. Agriculture is potentially a very important tool or process in the mitigation of climate change, but it's also the choices we make in agriculture have profound consequences on the air, on the water, on the condition of our planet. So, when I got to Wisconsin, there was another experiment underway. It had been underway for quite some time, and it was led by some of the people who understood both the limitations of agriculture and the vulnerabilities they faced as agricultural producers. The central part of Wisconsin is a sandy, beautiful soil. In fact, every Wisconsin school child knows the Wisconsin state soil is anigo loam. In that beautiful soil, they grow potatoes. 20 years ago, they realized we were having pesticide issues, we were having groundwater quality and quantity issues. There's a signature crane species in this part of the country called the Sandhill Crane, whose numbers had plummeted dramatically in the mid part of the 20th century. And so it was the potato farmers who took the initiative to tackle these environmental problems. These are large-scale potato farmers. They grow for McDonald's, they grow for, for McCain's, they grow for big industrial food purveyors. They didn't have what they needed, so they called on the science community to guide them forward in these commitments. And through that community, another network was Wisconsin Potato and Vegetable Growers Association. World Wildlife Fund came in, International Crane Foundation came in, and the University of Wisconsin came in and set a series of practices, including crane corridors, habitat restoration, very stringent IPM and monitoring. In fact, they created a standard to which World Wildlife Fund certified potato production that was so stringent with respect to characteristics like toxicity that even organic agriculture left in its ordinary state couldn't meet those standards. And so this was a pioneering effort driven by producers because who cares more about their long-term viability as a business than them? Well, this story didn't have chefs. And so, when I entered the state, people said, you know, we have this fabulous project, and it's a failure. Why? Because those producers expected that this behavior would be rewarded in the marketplace with a premium, and they were disappointed. There was no premium there. When I said, um, so, that's too bad, what are we going to do about it? We went to various large food companies and retailers. Nope, sorry, we're all for better produce, but we're not going to pay anymore. 
Turns out, a couple years later, guess what? Those producers are still following those standards, even though they cost money. And that was the signal that there was value in that effort. Not value recognized at that time with a premium in terms of product price, but value for the producers themselves. Pride and, and a knowledge that they were doing the right thing. Earlier this year, we checked up again, and actually it turns out there was an economic value as well, and that was in increased market share. So over the five or seven years, and meanwhile, the certification standard has lapsed, but the producers are still following those practices. When there's a choice, those who buy potatoes are buying these potatoes, healthy grown potatoes. Today, that healthy grown example is serving as a template for other national level, producer-driven sustainability initiatives. And we expect this November, um, supported by a, a sort of a network of academic scientists, to convene as many as nine or 10 or 11 or 12 major commodity groups in the US who have stepped outside of the supply chain accounting that is the, is the um, standard in this area, and they're moving to science-based, producer-driven, producer-led sustainability initiatives, you as chefs make purchase decisions that aggregate together to make choice, to make important incentives. But more than that, you as people who care and know about good food can tell the story um, about where you find your food and who grows it. You can talk, as you've just seen in dialogue, with those who produce the beautiful things you put on tables and those to whom you serve the food. So that healthy grown story is a very significant story because it shows us about value. The producers have brought us into an age I call the age of dissonance where the best behavior with respect to an agricultural operation can, in fact, lead a business to, um, to places that cost, that literally cost. And what this means is that it is time for an economic revolution. An economic revolution, we've discussed already in this meeting, that puts a complete balance sheet for agriculture on the planet. Monetized outcomes, monetized inputs, monetized outputs and the resources we use, the benefits that a healthy agricultural economy creates in a community, an integration of those three features that's so intimate you really can hardly separate them. That is really an economic transformation of a very profound type. In fact, as I've looked at this in the various roles I've played in government and in academia, I find only one economic transformation as profound as the one we need to undertake that will incentivize care of this earth. And that is the recognition in 1785 of the, of the need to abolish human bondage in our economy. The recognition, the concept was first put forward in 1785. We didn't get around to even fighting the US Civil War for 70 years. That's how radical an idea it was to have an economy without human bondage. It's estimated at the time that idea came forward, three quarters of the Earth's population were in some type of bondage. And Adam Smith was alive, that's how long ago it was. And Adam Smith said, you can't have an economy without human bondage. Well, it was, and there were economic arguments but there were moral arguments as to why we needed to make a profound transition to a different way of valuing our species. As you've heard, plants as a kingdom have values and, and biological attributes we're just beginning to understand. The earth and the way the earth systems work we are just beginning to understand. But we now understand that holistic framing that I first learned standing in Liz Henderson's pepper field on Peacework Farm. That holistic framing is, is complicated, but it's within reach in an age of radical transparency. And my world, the science world, has a very important obligation to step in and work to establish a concept of what a safe operating space 
for this planet and our species looks like. That work is well underway. You heard a beautiful um, illustration of it in Jackie's talk yesterday. There are many of us globally committed to bringing the best science forward in new relationships where agriculture and earth observations, where food, health, and diet choices are connected to environment and economy. That's the revolution we are part of. That's the revolution in which you are prophets. Because you talk about good food. You talk about healthy food systems because that's where good food comes from. Now, I do sit in rooms with, very, um, with people who command a lot of power and have great um, influence in the 20th century food system in which we live. That is true. And in fact, one thing as I have progressed into these conversations at scale um, that I've found is it's difficult for us in a 20th century economy to value the commons. We now understand something very obvious and very important, which is our Earth is a commons. That's what sustainability means. Our current economy is notoriously bad at dealing with commons. We devalue or deeply discount commons. And what we need to look forward to is a system that does a better job. The good news is there are wonderful examples of successes embedded in lots of failures. And in fact, the 2009 Nobel Prize in Economics was awarded to someone who has studied exactly how, um, has studied systems that do deliver benefits individually and collectively. As some economist friends of mine point out, she was not an economist. But maybe that's how these dialogues will go, partnerships. She's become an important teacher to me. Her name is Lynn Ostrom, and she studies decision making and the role of communities like mine in decision making, the role of communities like yours in decision making, because it turns out information is the currency of this century, and you are the voices of good food. So I want to conclude by pointing out that while, um, while we have uh, placed our planet in some very significant forms of jeopardy. There's hope in my world. And it's not hope because we're all going to just magically sit down and do the right thing. It's hope because we are finally developing the tools and sophistication to understand the risk that we have created. In fact, my new best friends are actuaries. You may not even know who actuaries are, and as they said to me on a conference call on Friday, we actuaries are a reserved lot. <laughs> what they do is they value risk. They value risk, they're conversant in monetized risk, but they also understand risk that is not yet monetized. And that is where I see the hope. That is the conversation we can have with any of us, because we live on one Earth, it's all of our Earth, and our local decisions aggregate. And we understand that now in this age of radical transparency. And so, we're learning. You're learning as you walk your ingredients to the field. You're learning as you talk to those who sit at your tables. We're learning. We're learning about systems. And as one of my tribal colleagues said to me, he said, you know, Molly, in this century, you, Western white people or, or Western culture, need to understand what my culture has never forgotten. He said, in our culture, our ethos is to live within our means. It's about enough, not more. Those instructions are incredibly profound. They involve a reorienting of the entire sort of agricultural science establishment and to take the messages you learn as you pioneer your craft, your art, your business in this century. In some ways, this is all very obvious. We have learned blindness in the 20th century. We took the world apart. We did very well in segments, and now it's time to put that world back together again. And that's why I emphasize partnerships. 
Through the medium of good food, your medium, you will bring messages of critical importance in this century. While you're doing that, please don't forget those who are not privileged to be able to come to your tables. And please remember the magnitude of the task before us. And, and resist the temptation to indulge in, in um, vilification or dismissal of people who are also learning with you. We share a planet that recognition is accessible to all of us, including some who are deeply committed, in, at least financially, to the system as, to the, and to the, to the way we produce food as it is now. Please remember, we need all hands on deck in this century, and you are the prophets as we move towards a, a new age, which I hope will exemplify a commitment to balance, to justice, and to harmony. Thank you. Woo.